morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. See all these friendly faces. I hope they're friendly. Yes, we did do an audit saying you need to do more training and look at this is great. What a gathering. Thank you, Darcy, for that introduction. I appreciate it. It's a really interesting time in the agency right now, and I can't think of a more important time for data. An important quality, reliable data, and you all are the foundation of that. When I was asked to speak, uh, there was some interest in talking a bit about climate change, but I'm not going to do that today. Rather, I'm going to talk about the challenges in air quality that we face here in Region 9 and the importance of data to our decision making. Region 9 covers California, Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and the Pacific Islands, so we have an extremely diverse geophysical setting, we have an extremely varied ecosystem, meteorology, and so forth. So with that come great challenges when it comes to monitoring. We have very challenging air quality issues associated with that geophysical setting, such varied issues as regional haze coming from the coal-fired power plants on the Navajo Reservation to the large dust storms or haboons that happen in Arizona, and how do you go about monitoring that and figuring out how that relates to ambient air quality. We have vol uh, volcanic organic gases in Hawaii, the VOG. How do you parse out what that is with respect to the overall ambient air quality? But today I'm going to focus on California. That's why you're here. So I'm going to start with a historical trend of air quality throughout Region 9, give you a sense of where things stand with respect to attainment status. And then I'm going to jump to some examples of how air quality data are currently being used uh, in Region 9 for data um, evaluation and for decision making. And hopefully that will provide sort of um, food for thought for you as you go into your next three days. Think about how important the work that you do is to the decisions that lead to clean air for the people of California. Okay, so first I want to start with air quality trends. There's been great success over the last many decades on air quality, and I'm going to just, let's maybe this takes off, I want to just kind of quickly go over this chart. So there's been overall a 63% improvement in air quality in the country. This is a national chart from 1980 to 2015. Concurrently, the increase in the general domestic product has been um, over 150%. There's been a doubling in the vehicle miles traveled. The population has gone up by 41%. And something that's kind of interesting to take a look at is if you look at energy consumption and CO2 emissions, pretty much track population, that's what you think. But the recession came in around here, as well as some additional policies were put in place. So you saw a reduction in both energy consumption, reflecting a lot of the investment in energy efficiency, and similarly a reduction in CO2. Interestingly, that's more or less sustained over the last decade. It's going to be interesting to see where that goes. So there's been significant improvement in air quality while there's been an increase in improvement in the economy. So I don't expect you to, take, to see each of these charts, but I went back in preparation for this talk to take a look at what has been the tra trends for all the criteria pollutants for Region 9. These are Region 9's charts. They show SO2, NO2, and lead. And as you can see, as the national trend has been downward, the trend in almost all of our areas in Region 9 has been downward as well. And again, this reflects a lot of investment in emission controls. It uh, reinforces change in lead in fuel, et cetera. But this all starts with data. This all starts with you. But for this, we wouldn't know where to go in the air quality program. OK, so let's take a little closer look at ozone. Similarly, ozone has shown a significant decline. This is a busy chart. You all that are data folks or monitoring folks, I think, um, can appreciate that. This represents a boatload of work. Um, but uh, if you look at the standards over time, these are the, well, it's kind of hard to see here, but 
this is the 2000 or the 1997 ozone standard and the 2008 standard. So in general, we're doing well with respect to the 97 standard. There are still some challenging areas that I'll get into in a little bit. And then when it comes to the 2008 standard, there's still some additional uh, challenges that we'll be facing. It's particularly true in the southern part of the state. Um, the top line here is Los Angeles. And there's been a 100 part per million decrease um, in the ozone design value since 1976. Now, the story for particulate matter is a bit more complicated. When I get together with my regional colleagues throughout the rest of the country, particulate PM is not highest on their radar. Maybe a little bit on the PM 2.5 side, but when it comes to PM 10, it really is a major issue in the southwestern part of the United States. So um, from a monitoring perspective, parsing out what this means, that's a challenge that we uniquely face in Region 9 and you face here in California. Um, so it's been up and down. We still have, we've had some improvements in various areas, but we still, the standard is here, we still have some areas that are challenging from a PM10 perspective. Taking a look at PM2.5, similarly, it's a bit of a mixed story. So the top chart here is for the annual PM2.5 standard, and below here is the 24 hour fine particulate standard. As you know, PM5 is a particularly critical pollutant for us to be controlling for because of the significant health impacts where the fine particles get lodged in your lungs and can cause significant health impacts. If you take a look at the 97 annual standard, we're doing pretty good. Still challenges in San Joaquin Valley. Similarly, if you look at the 97 24 hour standard, we're doing pretty good. We're almost there. San Joaquin is still one of the biggest challenging areas. When you look at the 2006 standard, similarly um, to ozone, we have a few number of areas that are still facing challenges, and that's true over here um, as well. And the 2012 standard is also posing challenges. So I'll get into this in a little bit more, um, especially in some of the rural areas where wood smoke is a problem. We're needing to really target our emission reductions. Okay, so what does this mean with respect to non-attainment areas and health risk? I'm going to show you a couple maps um, just for ozone and PM2.5. This is an, obviously a map of the United States. So we have some friends <laughs> in other parts of the country that are still addressing ozone pollution. California has a continuing problem, continuingly, continuing to experience the most challenging ozone problems, has the only extreme non-attainment areas in the country, and it's particularly a continuing challenge in the South Coast. PM2.5, as of 2012, and taking a look at the design values, there are challenges over here in the Ohio River Valley and a few other areas. There's one up there in Idaho. But if you look at this map in 2025, what the projections are, California will be the only area not attaining the PM2.5 problem. So PM5 and the combustion byproducts are going to continue to be a focus for us. So ozone and PM5 and PM10 are what we're, we're focusing on. Having said that, it's still important for us to continue to monitor the other criteria of pollutants. There are target areas that have issues such, um, for example, with lead in and around some of the smaller airports where there's still lead in the aviation fuel, et cetera. Ozone and PM2 point, uh, PM10, PM2.5 are our primary issues. Okay, a couple charts I find really um, valuable to take a look at. So these are all the regions in the country. We're region nine. As you can see, 39 million people live in non-attainment areas in Region 9. Of that, 34 million, um, which is about 23% of the population that is exposed to unclean air. 
So you can bet I really like this chart when I'm going and trying to get additional resources for the state of California and for Region 9 because, yes, there are issues here, but you compare us to our colleagues in the Midwest from an air quality perspective, we've got a little bit bigger problems here, you might say. The next two charts are ones that um, I also find very, very compelling. So this is a chart that shows the population-weighted population incremental exposure to ozone pollution. And it looks at all the non-attainment areas in the country, takes a look at the population, weights the exposure, and this gives us all an indication of if you're really targeting public health and where you should invest your money to get the biggest bang for your bunk, buck, it is in California. Los Angeles Basin, 34%. San Joaquin Valley, 6%. This is for ozone pollution. The rest of California, 6%. So you're looking at 46, almost half of the population weighted exposure in the country to ozone pollution or smog is in region not, or in California. This is profound. Your jobs are important. With PM 2.5, the picture is even more profound and even more importantly focuses on California. Again, population weighted exposure to the 2012 annual fine particulate standard. San Joaquin Valley, 15% of the population. South Coast, Basin, 32%, the rest of California. So almost three quarters of the population exposed to fine particulate are here in California. Okay, so that might kind of paint a bit of a bleak picture, but something that goes along with this is all of you in the room. So while California has really significant air quality problems, you also have the most sophisticated monitoring network, I want to say in the world, I don't know whether that's entirely true, but from my perspective, the most sophisticated monitoring network, the most sophisticated air quality management program, and the associated um, smart people to deal with these issues. So that gives me hope. And what I want to talk about next is some of the real-time issues that we're facing in Region 9 with your help and how we're using the information that you're providing us. Okay, one of the um, first and most important steps in the air quality and Clean Air Act world is to figure out what areas are not attaining the standards. This is critical. Many of you know this, I know, but that is what triggers all the actions, for the most part, many of the actions in the Clean Air Act for um, controlling, uh, controlling sources, controlling emissions. So we typically start with monitoring data. If you've got a violating monitor, then we look at these five factors. We're in the process of doing this for the 2015 ozone standard that was finalized a year and a few months ago. So this is the kind of map that we in Region 9 start with. The yellow dots here are all monitors with violating monitors, uh, with violations violating and showing violations of the standards. So the way that it's written, and maybe in the East Coast this makes sense, we start with the violating monitor and we say, okay, the beginning area is the full county. So the pink are the counties in which these violating monitors reside. Then we took a, take a look at what are the sources that are causing pollution? What are the population um, patterns in the area? What are the, uh, the traffic, et cetera? And we look at jurisdictional issues. And then we ultimately come down to the designation of the areas. And sometimes it's the whole county, such as in Imperial. Often it is smaller, so it's not all of San Bernardino County. It doesn't include this area out here. So we're in the process of doing this. The, uh, Air Resources Board and the governor has submitted recommendations for the boundary areas for California. And you may think this is kind of an easy thing to do. It's not always. So I'm going to give you one example. If you look up in Sutter Buttes, up in the northern part of the state, in Sutter County, this 
should be the yellow dot, but for whatever reason, it's navy blue on this slide. That is a violating, violating monitor. It's up on top of the Sutter views. So you take a look at this, you try to figure out, okay, what does this mean? Well, the first step for us would be, oh, well, it's all of Sutter County. All of Sutter County is a non-attainment area, therefore we should be controlling all the emission sources in Sutter County, et cetera. Well, the state didn't do that. The state submitted a recommendation of just the area that is above 2,000 feet. This is a monitor that's at elevation. There um, are no major sources around it, so it, they've recommended a very small sort of donut hole area. Looked at its a mountaintop area, and it's elevated. So that's the recommendation before us. That may, in fact, be where we end up when we finalize our decisions in October. But the story would have been very different had these monitors, either one of these monitors, this one over here in Calusa, or the one over here uh, in Yuma, Yuma City, if either one of those had been violating monitors, or you guys had seen like a kink in the data, our decision would be a lot less clear. So what you're doing is very important. All right, another example of how we use data is for clean data determinations. And this is when an area is a non-attainment area, but there is a pattern and a trend over three years that show that actually the area is attaining the national federal standard now. So we take a look at the three-year design value, we take a look at the preliminary data for the most recent year, and the data must continue to be below the NACs. If that's all adding up, we make a determination that the data are clean. There are more steps that we have to go through to make an area attainment. Um, but this is very important for many of our districts and our states because if we do a clean data um, determination, certain regulatory requirements are reduced. So we've got a real-time example here, and that is for Imperial County, which is uh, on the border with Mexico. This is the current PM 2.5 non-attainment area for the 2006 standard. And we recently published a recommendation. Um, we actually published a final decision that the data for the 2006 PM 2.5 standard are clean and we've done a clean data determination. This has not yet been published in the Federal Register, but we have made that determination. This was also a challenging issue for us. There were some questions about the data. We had to look very closely at the three-year uh, trends, and we had to look at this past year. So come December 31st of this year, and oh, have there been any violations? Have there been any violations? OK, we're good. So we went forward with the recommendation in January. But the, the monitoring data have been critical to this decision, and it's very important for those that are in people that live in Imperial County. Okay, another thing that, and probably one of the most important thing we do, uh, in, it's dependent on important, uh, the importance of accurate and reliable data is targeting control strategies. So I'm going to give three examples. Up in Plumas County, in the northern part of the state, we were starting to see a trend on violation of the PM 2.5 standard. We had three years of data or more where there were um, many areas that the, um, the area was not attaining. So we classified the area as non-attainment uh, in December of last year. It was really important for us to, and for the district and the state to work together to take a look at this very isolated problem, what is the diurnal pattern that you see, and what is the composition of the particulate. Based on this information, the district competed, determined that it was wood stoves, took a look at what the source is. It's wood stoves, you can see that, they, that the levels go higher uh, when people are coming home from work and starting to heat their wood stoves and it continues on through the night and reduces as people leave to do their work for the day. It also, as you can see, happens mostly in the winter time. So it was very clear that it was the wood stoves that were causing the problem. The district successfully competed, competed for an almost two and a half million grant from EPA. We were able to provide that. 
and in turn they um, uh, have implemented a very aggressive program to help people change out their stoves. It's important that people have those stoves for heating. And just in the program from April to December of 2016, 105 stoves were changed out. The city also adopted a comprehensive ordinance so that um, stove use is regulated moving forward. And this is a profound result. With this very simple, targeted strategy, with some funding, focused on reducing the emissions from those wood stoves, we've seen a 33% reduction in the number of days exceeding the 24-hour standard compared to December of 2015. But again, I point out, it was the data that we had that helped us solve this problem. Another example is up in the uh, Great Basin area of California over on the eastern side of the Sierra. And this is Owens Lake. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are aware that in the early 1900s, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power diverted water from the Owens River, the lake bed dried, and so there have been huge, huge uh, dust problems up in that area. And the levels are so high, this is a logarithmic scale. So they needed a logarithmic chart to be able to show the um, emissions um, at various times, 10 times over the standard. But you can see there's been great success. Why has there been this success? They've had a very robust monitoring network. They were able to document the problems that really helped the district negotiate a, um, a hallmark settlement with Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And with this unique monitoring network around the lake bed, they target the emission reduction um, methodologies, the controls, the best management practices to the type of emissive areas on the lake. And this is another unique component of it. They're monitoring it to see if it's successful on a yearly basis and if there's a need to tweak the emission controls, they do that on a yearly basis. So this has been extremely successful. And just the last example, going from sort of more rural areas to the very populated, populated areas here in the South Coast Basin where we are today, um, many of you are, are very well aware of the problems here. It's significantly focused on mobile sources. So um, as we speak, the Air District is in the process of finalizing their 2016 air quality management plan yeah, through a very strong understanding of the emissions inventory and where the problems are occurring. They've identified a number of measures. There's going to need to be anywhere from 45 to 55 percent further reduction in NOx from primarily mobile sources. So that's my last example on how data are used to target control strategies. Okay, and then I just have a couple final examples of the importance of reliable data. One is real-time data um, for fire. So the 26, I've got uh, just two slides summarizing where things were with the 2016 fire season. Um, there were almost uh, 6,900 acres that, or excuse me, 563,000 total acres with 6,800 documented fires. I find that phenomenal, 6,800 documented fires. Nine fires alone were 10,000 acres, so including the Soberanis, Erskine, and the Sand fires. We had staff on site providing real-time data um, and Based on preliminary 2016 data, several Region 9 air districts are showing elevated levels. I'm going to show you um, a slide on that. But this thing is what is profound to me. This fire season we've just gone through is actually average in the total acreage and below average in the number of fires when you compare it to the last 15 years. So we're going to see more of this. This chart um, was put together to take a look at some of the uh, trends from May to September in 2016, taking a look at the P, uh, P24 hour PM 2.5 levels. And as you can see, there were definitely peaks at certain times when the fires were really burning and the smoke was per, um, particularly high. Um, so like for example, in the Carmel Valley uh, during the Silveranis fire, 
many times there were levels over the, the NAS. So this was very important for firefighters as they were fighting the, um, the fires, as well as this is going to be useful information um, as we go forward in um, implementing Clean Air Act pro programs. If you're looking at exceptional events, how does this factor in? And then just lastly, reliable data has been very important for us over the years. <coughs> Uh, we get sued very often, the district do as well. So the work that you're doing and doing it well is critical. We've been challenged on the quality assurance project plans. Why should I do a quality assurance project plan? It's critical for us to depend on those data. There's got to be a good plan in place. We've had questioning on the QAQC measures and questions regarding the maximum concentration load locations, is that network designed properly, and so forth. And we anticipate, unfortunately, that litigation is going to co continue. So in a court of law, they're digging deep and, um, and are looking at the data. So just by conclusion, um, I just really want to thank you. The work you do is very, very important. I know I depend on our technical staff in our office, and they, in turn, reach out to you. Um, when we made the finding that there was a need for additional training, the Air Resources Board rallied and has put together this training. It's really important, um, and I want to really thank you for the time that you're putting in here today. As I mentioned, California's network is unparalleled throughout the country and fundamental to our decisions. If you take a look at some of the emerging issues, it's challenging us in ways we haven't been challenged before. For example, we've got many, many citizens who are wanting to do more and more monitoring. We're getting closer to um, that point where what is background and what is not, and what is it really, how does that relate to international transport for ozone? Better understanding what is happening in the atmosphere and so forth. And we know that these emergent issues are going to, going to continue. But I'm very confident moving forward into the next decade um, because of people like you and the work that you're doing. And um, we're really happy to be partners with you moving forward. So I just want to close by thanking you as well. And I also just want to take a moment for my staff to stand up, the EPA folks that are here today or will be coming. So if you guys can stand up. We've got people from our QA office and from our monitoring office. And I hope you guys With that, Darcy, do you want to take questions, or uh, do you want to? It's a controversial topic with the, with the salt and sea. Um, you know, there's always uh, some side that do decide to have that lake 
being that it's not a natural lake, you know, it was, it was kind of produced. Um, but at the same time, you know, representing the Imperial County, we do know is the importance of keeping that playa, you know, suppressed by adding more water to it and not letting it dry. So, it, I mean, I couldn't answer that question right now. I know it's a, it's a topic, and I believe there's kind of be something mentioned uh, throughout this training. We have uh, somebody talking about that. So, um, you know, there's, there's many projects, actually, we, uh, my partner and I, we've been exposed to. There's, there's different projects, even uh, pumping water from the Seal um, uh, Cortez to actually help, uh, you know, elevate the, the, the water uh, and somehow to mitigate. So, um, like I said, it's a very controversial topic right now. It's, um, it definitely, it's, a, it's an impact uh, to the Imperial County since predominant winds usually it's from the Northwest. So, uh, we, do, we do get it all the way to the border. So. And I would just add in, I know the district, um, Imperial District and South Coast will, and I guess be considering this as well, um, has considered or has adopted some prospective rules, um, somewhat taken from the lessons learned in Owens, um, to, as the playa gets exposed, to put in place best management practices at that time. So that could be gravel, that could be other types of soil stabilization, <laughs> such as um, manufactured or uh, putting in wetlands. It could be other ways to basically control the dust. And I believe those measures may have been adopted. In yeah, they, they are. They are. And I know as we speak, I know uh, Imperial County, along with, uh, in conjunction with the Imperial Irrigation District, uh, they're moving forward, trying to get within the, the water control board and find out. Uh, the, the biggest problem here is the funding. You know, it's like anything. You know, you need the, the resources, the funding, so you can do the proper mitigation. So there's, like I said, there's multiple projects. There's, uh, you know, along with uh, mitigating the dust, but also um, how to uh, use and make, make it a sustainable kind of. Uh, project to not only all of our water, you know, our disposal from the animal, from from uh, our waste goes down to that salt and sea. So in prevention to not just contaminate it more, but, you know, let's clean it while we add it, you know, and not just do all the runoff to the salt and sea. So right. yeah, multiple projects at the same time. Yeah, it's a really interesting juxtaposition between water management practices and air quality practices. Other two quick things. See Michael Benjamin here, um, Air Resource Bureau with the company here. So they've got a, a great study underway to take a look at the metals composition of the sediments um, because not only are we concerned or interested about the dust, but we're going to need to understand um, if there's any kind of uh, toxics concerns in and around the lake. So and there's you know, this partnership between the South Coast and the Imperial District since it straddles both areas. So thank you for the question. As you mentioned, there is a presentation. This was a topic that people wanted to hear about, so we arranged for Earl Withicombe on uh, day three to give a presentation. He's going to give it twice. Um, it is a great presentation to learn more about uh, what's going on in, in that area and some of the control strategies that have occurred um, since the issue became uh, apparent. So. Uh, take a look at your agenda, so you, if you're interested in that, it, it is a great presentation. All right, well, I know you have a very busy agenda going forward, so I want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here, and um, I look forward to partnering in the years ahead.